Upper Echelon is brought to you by Deloitte. For innovative thinking and thorough strategic planning, turn to Deloitte. In studio today is Sandy Lissankru. Uh, he's currently an executive director of the international mining group Exara, uh, Extrata, rather, but has been involved in the South African economy for many years as an entrepreneur. Um, entrepreneurs, that is what we really need to fix the country. Um, uh, yes, you're right. I mean, thanks very much for making the time to um, let me to your studios to, uh, today. It's uh, really an honor. Uh, to be here. Indeed, um, we, we need uh, entrepreneurs uh, in the country, um, but also we need to ensure that uh, we understand that the route to entrepreneurship is not an easy route, in the sense that uh, it is fought with uh, uh, areas of uh, success on the one hand, but is also littered um, with, uh, with failures um, on the other hand. I do believe that as a nation, we obviously need to learn from our past mistakes and, uh, and also ensuring that we create the right um, climate for entrepreneurship uh, to, to flourish. And that really talks to a number of issues. Um, one amongst this is to ensure that um, we encourage uh, um, you know, um, entrepreneurship by ensuring that the rules of the game in terms of uh, entry into that space um, are not uh, um, destructive or full of hurdles, but also at the same time ensuring that we um, encourage that as an alternative to, to big business. In other words, uh, there is small entrepreneurship, but there's also big pr entrepreneurship. So we, I also think that the individuals have got a role to play, institutions as well have got a role to play, government also has a role to play. Mm. And Ire, um, just before we get to your corporate history, which is a very illustrious one, uh, just where, where do you come from? How did you, uh, you know, what is the road you took to be in, in that seat today? Sure, I mean, for me personally, it has been... Uh, a journey and uh, not necessarily an easy one. I was uh, born in the uh, Eastern Cape uh, in the rural areas of the uh, Transkei. I, uh, I grew up there and um, spent some um, my education uh, in the rural village of uh, Dalawonga in, in Kofimbaba. And uh, when I completed my trek um, at the age of uh, 17, I was not in a fortunate position like many families where I could have money to proceed uh, straight to uh, pursue uh, further studies. So, uh, you know, I remember very well speaking to my mother saying, look, I've now completed metric and said, look, there is no money. So I had to go and uh, work um, in the mines. So When was this? This was in the 80s. Yeah, this was... Um, end of 1983 um, when I completed. Uh, so my father was working in the mines. In those days, it was the uh, Western Transvaal, you know, in the small area called uh, Orkney. That's where he was working. So I was able to secure a job there as a clerk. Um, so I worked uh, in the mines for a year. Uh, concurrently, I was um, applying to various um, universities to secure entrance, at the same time applying to secure bursary as well. I was fortunate in that uh, I was able to do that uh, for, for a year. And at the end of that year, I was uh, both successful in terms of uh, being admitted at uh, Rhodes University, but also uh, in terms of say, having been able to secure uh, bursary through, through the then um, Transkei government you know, to go and study uh, for a BCom degree at uh, Rhodes University. But you didn't stop at a BCom degree. Uh, you, you studied at five universities. You've got an MBL from UNISA. You've even got the Advanced Management Program. You followed the Advanced Management Program at the very prestigious NC Graduate uh, Business School in France. Um, you know, obviously you are dedicated to education. Do you think it's really critical for success in, in South Africa to go to that extreme? I think for me, I mean, it, it, it was a, a couple of things. One, um, I knew that uh, to get myself out of the situation that I had found myself in, in terms of the, the die, you know, uh, conditions that, uh, you know, we're faced with as a family, 
I saw education as one of those um, liberators in terms of uh, you know freeing myself from from the kind of economic conditions that I was faced. But I also had told myself that uh, even though I might have started that way, you know, I was not going to finish that way. So so there was this uh, personal drive and quest for success uh, that has been the uh, the guiding light, as it were, in my own life. But also felt that, you know, for one to be able to provide leadership in a number of areas, you know, and also l looking at how other countries um, that have been able to achieve true liberation. I mean, if you look at some of the countries in the 60s and the 70s, those that are leading the world today have been those countries that have, uh, you know, been able to produce a number of uh, people that are highly educated and learned. So I felt that uh, for me to, to be able to make a contribution, you know, in terms of my own life and, and, and improve the quality of my own life and also be able to become an active uh, leader in my own country, uh, the only route that would help me to achieve and uh, sustain that would be through, you know, a what I would refer to as a a relentless pursuit, you know, for academic success and excellence. But that's one of the problems we currently face in South Africa. You know, it is difficult uh, for a, a person, not only because of lack of money, but also for, for access to get a proper education, especially uh, secondary, uh, secondary and, and tertiary. You know, um, I think I think you're right. I mean, there there are a number of uh, areas in terms of um, education in the country at the moment. But just looking back at my own experience, I mean, I, I, I'm sitting here, but as a product of uh, Bantu education, which at that time was considered to be a very inferior, you know, quality of education. But be that as it may, uh, we've been able to you know strive to uh, work hard. You know, I think there is uh, also an element of, I think, about how how hungry do we want, you know, to succeed as our own people. So there's, a, there's part of that that uh, comes from within, you know, but the, the other part is, uh, is discipline. I, I think that uh, we also need as, uh, as people to be very disciplined, but also to make sacrifices along the way. But having said that, I do believe that education is still a, a, a challenge for the country. And unless and until such time we're able to make inroads in, into that area, you know, we will still going to, to be in a disadvantage. And even the, 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 gl the number of uh, noble goals and, uh, and uh, 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 objectives that we have as a country, you know, our ability to, to achieve that you know, would still be a compromise. I do believe that uh, part of uh, the solution is that all of us, we need to make our own contribution. In other words, um, it's good uh, for government to make its own contribution, but also I think uh, both uh, as corporates as well, you know, we need to make uh, identify areas where we can, you know, make uh, interventions and contributions. For example, in the area of maths and science, you know, um, I think this is one area that we need to make sure that either we provide mentorship or, 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 or we will provide extra lessons just to, to try and augment and supplement what is already available. But I also think that even as individuals, you know, we, we need to see if, for example, we cannot uh, adopt a child and, you know, try and see if we cannot help them to, to be educated because some of them have got good talents, but they just lack the, the, the financial wherewithal to, to advance themselves uh, educationally. Mm. Uh, you know, good education does not guarantee, you know, uh, corporate success. But uh, if you look at the companies you've been involved with over the last, well, since your uh, entry into the formal job sector, it, it's very impressive, uh, not only in the names, but also in the diversity of the industries. Um, companies like Pioneer Foods, uh, Prodigy Chorus, Asset Management, Silverbridge, Budget Foods, PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, Metropolitan Holdings, Impala, Liberty Life, Cajiso, and extrata, you know, obviously you have moved from different industries. Uh, do you think, uh, you know, well, how do you move from different industries? What principles do you apply to make a success in these diverse industries? Look, I think I, uh, uh, I've been fortunate in the sense that um, having uh, have a good uh, financial knowledge and skills, you know, it, it makes the transition 
to move from one industry to to the other uh, pretty seamless i mean compared to to the other skills for example that may may be industry specific you know so by their very nature i mean those kind of skills are not only uh, portable skills but uh, they they give you the discipline and the rigor you know to be able to interrogate issues and and also to be able to to provide and add value in whatever sector that you you fit in but secondly i mean the having done a, 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 an mbl has also helped me to be far more well rounded in the way in which i think and and I approach uh, issues and problems and so on and so forth and the last thing is 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 just you know to take it upon yourself as a as a as a director to actually read extensively on the industry that uh, you're participating in to understand what are the the fundamentals of that particular industry what are the drivers etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think that uh, i mean the overall you know approach in terms of this unending and unrelenting quest to for knowledge and you know it, i think it's it's one of those things that has been able to put me in a very good stead as and when i'm faced with these kinds of you know switching over from one industry to the next in the early 2000s, you also ventured into government. Uh, you were the deputy DG uh, of finance and corporate services in the Department of Public Works. Uh, how long were you in government? Uh, I mean, I must say, I mean, before I deal with the issue of uh, the duration of government, uh, probably one of the most exciting time, and uh, in the sense that uh, it, it helped me to understand, you know, how things work on the side of government, and uh, because I think sometimes if you are in the private sector. Uh, we don't appreciate how that machinery works, and uh, to to begin to understand how 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 policies are formulated, you know how that 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 government as an institution operates, you know I, I also felt that that was quite a very useful you know opportunity to add in terms of my my, my broader bag of experience, and and I still like to encourage. You know, people, if if uh, they are presented with an opportunity like that, to be exposed to the intricacies of how government works and so on and so forth, it's something that uh, as a broad area of uh, experience, it it comes in quite handy. I learned a lot personally uh, from a viewpoint of uh, uh, dating one's hands and helping uh, to put in place some processes, uh, financial processes uh, and, and disciplines and systems and so on and so forth, and also to be able to see that people that have come after me having built up on those things and you know be able to make success of that unfortunately uh, I, I stayed only for two years uh, because I was then headhunted to to go and head uh, you know an asset management company but uh, I mean I still even to this day you know rely back and leverage number one the relationships that have been able to 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 build you know during that time but secondly also understanding you know the way in which government thinks because i think that becomes a quite a, a crucial ingredient in terms of finding solutions to the problem that we have as a country not necessarily to look at those problems from our own point of view as business, just to begin to understand how government thinks, what informs the, the positions that they take. So for me, I think that was quite a valuable time. But there's a lot of issues currently with service delivery. Uh, you know, how do you look now at government? Um, you know, how, how should that be rectified? Um, you know, one of the, 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 the big um, elements that is causing poor service delivery is uh, a lack of really proper skills. Um, do you think that can be addressed uh, in the short term? Look, I think uh, the, the, we can still build some um, areas of pockets of success as it were, by piloting new initiatives, you know, because probably to try and deal with, the, with this kind of problem holistically, it may, may, may be overwhelming. But uh, number one, I think we, we should not uh, only uh, analyze the problems, but we should also be forthcoming, you know, with the solutions, you know, that are besetting us as far as these problems are concerned. By that I mean that, uh, for example, we should uh, try and see areas where both uh, the private sector and government can pilot, you know, you know, initiatives where we can strengthen capacity. You know, either at a provincial level or at a municipal level. For example, I'm thinking of areas where, you know, we could second uh, capacity. 
you know, that we would help, for example, to uh, empower the people, you know, uh, the, that are responsible for service delivery to ensure that they've got the requisite skills, they have a better understanding of processes and systems and so on. Because when I look at some of the challenges that are there, uh, for example, in terms of project management ability and so on, these are the very same areas that uh, private sector has been able to be successful on, you know. So we've got these uh, areas where one area or segment of society has been able to achieve excellence. And, uh, but on the other area, you know, there is serious lack of, of delivery. But we also need to manage the, um, the, the deficit in the trust relationship as well between government and the private mm -hmm. sector because it, it is at the heart of, 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 of some of the areas where you know, that kind of cooperation and, and collaboration is impeded. It seems to be a significant distrust between the private sector and um, the public sector which, uh, which needs to be overcome. We've got uh, structural problems in our economy. Um, how do you think we will or should overcome this distrust? Look, at, I think, I mean, you, we, at a practical level, I mean, it, it would have to start with us, you know, identifying those areas where we can build, you know, momentum. You know, um, for example, we could um, uh, focus, for example, either it's the mining industry or the manufacturing industry, where we have representatives from either government or, or labor and the business, you know, and start working through the issues at a practical level. I'm reminded, for example, that in the case of the of the mining industry, we have uh, the MIG debt process, where it's uh, the social partners from labor, government, and, 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 and the Chamber of Mines have put a structure like that in place to work through systematically, you know, the problems that are standing in the way of the competitiveness of the mining industry, but also how to ensure that you know we can address issues of, of transformation I'm using that as an example where we can use the successes and the achievements of platforms like those to bridge the trust divide and you need those kinds of initiatives that if they can be replicated you know and you're all alternatively able to record success in those areas that you see those being uh, emulated and then also throughout the country and it, it's it's a it's going to be a long journey and we need to be realistic about what is doable and sustainable because of our past and because of our history and so on and so forth. But we need to move forward because this it would continue to hamstring the ability of the country to pursue its, its, its developmental goals and objectives. You are at the head of a big mining company in, in South Africa, um, but things will need to change in the near term. You know. Currently, uh, there's a lot of uh, unhappiness with with, uh, with the private sector that uh, the resources of South Africa, which is immense, are not being mined and and and, and produced uh, for the benefit of the for the whole country. So there will be some structural change. How do you foresee this to to play out? How do you think the mining industry will look in a decade? Uh, will it be significantly different to what we see today? Look, I mean. Uh I think let's uh, deal with a number of uh, issues, I mean, in terms of the, the question that you, you're posing. One is that uh, let's, let's uh, think back that a lot of things that have been achieved in South Africa have been achieved through dialogue. So I think there is a space that uh, needs to be created for these kinds of dialogue to, to take place between the, the, uh, the industry, uh, government, and also the, the, the labor movement. So, so that uh, we can all come up with a kind of a vision of the kind of a mining industry that we would like to have. The mining industry that, number one, uh, create jobs. The mining industry that is also competitive in the, uh, in the sense that uh, we cannot run away from the fact that um, capital is mobile. So we need to ensure that as a country, we create a, the conducive investment environment that will be able to mobilize capital and attract new capital. So having said that, that does not mean that we do not have broader socioeconomic objectives or community needs that we need to achieve and pursue. But it is a lot better 
to achieve and sustain those in a growing mining industry. So our focus, therefore, should be on ensuring that we achieve growth, but also defining you know, the respective role of each of, each of these uh, players. For example, there is something that we would need to do as a mining industry to make sure that uh, we, are, we are competitive, uh, we create jobs, but also think that uh, we would need um, an environment where you know, there's better certainty in terms of the regulatory environment and the policy environment, but also there is a significant investment that is made in terms of infrastructure, you know, and that some of these costs are affordable and competitive. I don't particularly think that we have a silver bullet in terms of solving these kinds of problem, but there is a space for a conversation, a number of conversations, which is geared towards ensuring that we can secure a common vision and a common understanding of the kind of future that we want to have as a mining industry. Have you considered uh, uh, to continue your uh, career in politics? Um, no, not really, but I mean, I, I, I read up uh, quite extensively on uh, a number of, uh, you know, books. I mean, there's, um, uh, I'm reading a, a book now by Francis uh, Fukuyama, you know, which um, talks about, you know, um, the, the, the end of history, you know, which is some of those things that do fascinate me, but not as a career, unfortunately. That was Andy Lesancre, the Executive Director of Extrata.